a massive new release of Type 1a supernova data. Did astronomers see a strange star form for the first time? Huge spiral arms of comets in the Oort cloud and the highest energy neutrino ever detected. Plus, in our extended version on Patreon, how scientists could get real data on UAPs. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Astronomers want to understand the scale of the universe. And the way that astronomers measure distance in the universe is they use what's called a standard candle. Now, there are a bunch of ways from the Cepheid variables to astrometry, but in the middle ranges, the hundreds of millions to billions of light years away from us, astronomers rely on type 1a supernovae. These are where you've got a white dwarf star like the dead remnant left over from a star like our sun, which are consuming material from some partner star. And when they reach this number 1.4 times the mass of the sun, it can hold no more. And then the star explodes and it explodes with a known amount of energy. And so astronomers are able to spot these type 1a supernova going off. They know how intrinsically bright they are. And so then they measure the brightness they can see. And that allows them to calculate the distance to the star. And they're not very common. While we might see supernova go off in the Milky Way every 50 years or so, not that we have seen them recently, but in general, they're supposed to happen about every 50 to 100 years. Type 1a supernova can take 500 years on average to go off within the Milky Way. And so over decades of observing type 1a supernova, astronomers had only collected a couple of thousand of them. But now astronomers working with the Zwicky Transient Facility just dropped data on 3,628 type 1a supernova, doubling the number of these supernova that we know of. The Zwicky Transient Facility is a survey instrument. It is a collection of telescopes that is able to see a 47 degree view of the sky. And it scans the entire northern night sky every single night, collecting information on its 600 megapixel CCD. And so it moves fast and it's able to sense objects as dim as 20th 0.5 magnitude. With the sensitivity and its wide field of view and the fact that it is scanning the entire northern night sky every single night, it's able to see every single type 1a supernova within 1.5 billion light years of us. And so astronomers can now use this giant collection of data to confirm a bunch of the things to measure distances in the universe to watch as the large scale structures of the universe are changing over time throughout the history of the cosmos. And I found this really exciting. But also, you know, what does this kind of sound like? This sounds like the upcoming Vera Rubin Observatory, which is going to do a similar thing, but in the southern hemisphere. And just to give you a sense of scale, Vera Rubin is probably going to find a million type 1a supernova within its 10 year initial run. So astronomers will go from knowing about 3000 to close to 7000 thanks to Zwicky to a million of these type 1a supernova within 10 years of Vera Rubin's operations. If you want to learn more about how astronomers use type 1a supernova to measure distance in the universe, I highly recommend this interview that I did with Nobel Prize winner Adam Reese about his work on Cepheid variables as well as we talk about type 1a supernova. Did astronomers just witness the formation of a strange star? When stars die, what you're left with depends on the mass of the star that died. So when you have a star that is 0.08 to eight times the mass of the sun, when it dies, it puffs off its outer layers, and then it collapses down and it becomes a white dwarf. It's essentially the core of the star that is now revealed to the cosmos. But if the star was more massive between eight and 20 times the mass of the sun, then it detonates as a supernova, and you're left with a neutron star. And neutron stars are fascinating. They are made of neutrons it's right there in the label. And that's because the incredible gravitational pressure merges the protons and the electrons together and just creates neutrons. And they're made of degenerate matter. And it means there aren't enough quantum states available at the lower energy levels. There's no more room. But what happens if you try? What happens if you try to jam more clowns into the clown car? Well, it's believed that you get a black hole and a gamma ray burst because you have reached this limit of how much material you can have in the neutron star and then it collapses down into a black hole. But some astronomers think that there might be an intermediate stage between the neutron star and the black hole. And that is because the fundamental particles of neutrons are quarks. And so if you could then compress this further, 
you would actually turn it from individual neutrons into this soup of quarks. And so with a little more mass, keep going, then maybe then you turn into a black hole. And now astronomers think they've actually seen the formation of a strange star for the first time. So a team of Chinese astronomers were observing a gamma ray burst, and they saw this really strange behavior where it brightened, it then took a pause, for more than 100 seconds, and then it brightened again, and then took another pause and then brightened again. And what they think might be happening is that you had this star detonate as a supernova, it then collapsed into a magnetar, and then maybe in falling material added more mass to this object, it released a bunch more energy, and then it collapsed down one more time into a quark star, a strange star. So it might be that this object is now a strange star, a quark star just hanging out there in, in the cosmos. And maybe as it consumes more material, it'll collapse down into a black hole. And so this would be really exciting if this intermediate phase between neutron stars and black holes have actually been found. But of course, this is just the beginning of this research. When did the moon solidify? The giant impact theory says that shortly after the formation of the solar system, shortly after the formation of the Earth, a Mars sized object crashed into our planet, sprayed out debris into space, and then that debris coalesced into what is now the moon. But when it started out, it was a ball of molten magma. And then over a few hundred million years, it cooled down to the point that it was actually solidified on its surface. Now, when did this happen? Well, thanks to the Apollo missions, astronauts went to the moon and brought back samples from the surface of the moon. And in those samples that they brought back from the moon, scientists were able to calculate the age when those rocks crystallized on the surface of the moon. But after the moon solidified and crystallized, there was a residual liquid on the surface of the moon that contains potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus. Now, if you add these up, you get K for the potassium, rare earth elements, and P for the phosphorus, and that gives you creep. So knowing when this creep formed, that tells you when the surface of the moon had finally solidified. And the established theory was that it happened about 4.43 million years ago. But astronomers used modern lab equipment with freshly opened Apollo samples and some of the most powerful instruments on Earth, and they were able to calculate very precisely that the moon solidified about 140 million years after the solar system formed. Spiral arms in the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is a giant spherical group of icy objects surrounding the solar system. And it's estimated that there are between tens of trillions and hundreds of trillions of objects bigger than one kilometer across out in the Oort cloud. Now it's a very big space. It starts outside of the Kuiper belt and then goes all the way out to maybe 100,000 astronomical units, which is starting to close in on the halfway point between us and the Alpha Centauri system. But researchers have wondered what is happening with the Oort cloud and how does that interact with the Kuiper belt? And they did a bunch of simulations about how the giant planets in the solar system are interacting with all of the objects in the Kuiper belt. And what they found is that you're getting these gravitational perturbations by the giant planets that are driving objects out of the Kuiper belt and into the Oort cloud. But what makes this really cool is that now the galactic tide takes over the motions of these objects. That's like the sum gravitational interaction by the rest of the galaxy acting on the solar system. And that is channeling the particles in the Oort cloud into two spiral arms. Now it's estimated they start around the 1000 astronomical unit mark, they end at around the 15,000 astronomical unit mark. And so you get these spiral arms that extend across the solar system about 30,000 astronomical units. And these define the shape of the inner part of the Oort cloud. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the most interesting story of the week. And the winner last week was the fact that the chance of the asteroid hitting Earth had doubled. Now, because we're going to want to add these up at the end of the year, uh, we're going to we don't want to have the same story win twice in a row. And so the runner up was James Webb sees newly forming planets and that'll probably go into our year end rundown. But on an update, Turns out now NASA has downgraded the chance of that asteroid hitting to 0.28%, but there's a 1% chance of the asteroid hitting the moon. Anyway, it's complicated. This is going to keep going until finally it gets 
rounded down to zero. So stay tuned for that. Now we post the vote into our channel into the post tab within 24 hours of when we release this episode of Space Bite. So if you're just scrolling on YouTube, give us a vote. And otherwise, make sure you subscribe to our channel, click on the notifications bell, and then just train the algorithm that you want more space news and less AI slop. The highest energy neutrino ever. Neutrinos are lightweight particles that are produced by various high energy events here in the universe. So they are produced by the sun, they're produced by supernova, they're produced at the accretion disks around supermassive black holes, they're in nuclear reactors. In fact, there are hundreds of trillions of neutrinos passing through your body every second, and you don't even feel it. And so Trying to detect neutrinos is incredibly difficult and it requires a large volume of water. Now you're probably familiar with the ice cube neutrino observatory that is down in Antarctica and scientists are setting up another neutrino observatory in the Mediterranean Ocean. It's called the cubic kilometer neutrino telescope or KM three net. And they're just in the process of building this. They're about 10% complete in February when they already got an incredibly strong neutrino detection. Just explain how this works. Like a neutrino passes into the telescope, essentially into the cubic kilometer of water. It strikes a molecule of water and releases a shower of muons. The muons are slowed by the water. And so by calculating where this fragmented cloud of muons reaches, astronomers are then able to track back where the actual collision happened and how much energy the neutrino had when it struck the water. And the one that they detected was the most energetic neutrino that has ever been detected into the teravolt range. And astronomers don't really have a good explanation for how you can get neutrinos that are this powerful, probably not from the sun, maybe from supernovae, maybe from the accretion disks around supermassive black holes. And the thought is that under a certain kind of configuration of a supermassive black hole that is actively feeding called a blazar, that's how you can get neutrinos with this high of energy. But I mean, this is still just 10% of the construction of the telescope. So let's wait until they finish cooking. Webb spies fireworks around Sagittarius A star. The James Webb Space Telescope is looking out to the edge of the observable universe. It's looking at extrasolar planets, but it is also scanning the core of the Milky Way. And that's because this region is shrouded in gas and dust that is opaque to other telescopes. But James Webb Infrared Observatory, it can see through it and watch the vicinity around the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. So astronomers were able to get time on Webb and they're able to watch it for several big chunks of time. And during those periods, they saw a series of flares flashing from the vicinity around the supermassive black hole. They've detected about five to six of these flares every day, some stronger, some weaker, and they appear to be completely random. And so they're wondering what could be causing these flares. And right now it's still early days, but the theory is that you get turbulence in the accretion disk that's around this supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. Also, you can get magnetic reconnection events in the powerful fields that surround the supermassive black hole and interact with its accretion disk, very similar to the mechanism that releases flares off of the sun, but at a vaster scale, a huge collection of intermediate mass black holes. There are stellar mass black holes, and there are supermassive black holes, and we have plenty of examples of both. But how do you go from a stellar mass black hole to a supermassive black hole, you should have a time in between what astronomers call an intermediate mass black hole. But these have been very elusive. But there are, have been a couple of tentative discoveries in globular clusters and in dwarf galaxies. And we actually reported on the detection of an intermediate mass black hole in the Omega cluster, which is the largest globular cluster here in the Milky Way. One other interesting discovery came from LIGO where astronomers detected a 65 solar mass black hole merging with an 85 solar mass black hole. That shouldn't be possible unless you can have these intermediate mass black holes. And so an instrument that's been in the news recently is the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. And this is used to measure the large scale structure of the universe. It's measuring all the way out to billions of light years away from us. And astronomers have been able to detect hundreds 
of quasars in dwarf galaxies. So imagine galaxies like the small and large Magellanic Cloud, but they're mini quasars where they're actually blasting out radiation in the same way that a supermassive black hole in the heart of M87 might be doing, but at a smaller scale. And that they were able to calculate that these would qualify as intermediate mass black holes. And so they were able to add 300 intermediate mass black holes to the collection of known black holes. According to the study, they found 2500 dwarf galaxies with an active nucleus, and they were able to calculate that about 2% of dwarf galaxies have the mini version of a quasar at their center. As you know, I like to share really cool astronomy pictures. So I'd like to share two of them. First, this is the star cluster RCW 38. It's a molecular cloud of ionized hydrogen. It's about 5,500 light years away from Earth in the constellation Vela. And in this cluster, you're looking at young stars, giant stars and protostars that are blasting out radiation, and they're causing the surrounding gas to heat up, and then it gives off its own radiation. The second image was released on Valentine's Day, and that it's like a cosmic flower in the large Magellanic cloud. But it is an incredible image. And this is a star forming region in the large Magellanic cloud designated NGC 2040. And it's filled with type O and B stars. These are the largest, hottest, most massive stars that astronomers know of. There's at least a dozen of them in this nebula. And they are blowing out really powerful stellar winds that is creating these giant cavities in this nebula. The picture was taken by the Gemini South Telescope, which has a wavelength range just outside what we can see as human beings. You can see a bit into the ultraviolet, a bit into the infrared, and so it gives us a really great view of this nebula. While you're watching this week's Space Bites, I'm writing my weekly email newsletter, The Guide to Space. It contains dozens of stories that you're not going to see here in Space Bites or really kind of anywhere else on the internet. For example, an ancient galaxy is still forming stars when it should be dead. Should astronauts be worried about Mars dust? And how sulfur could be a new tool for finding alien life. The newsletter goes out to 70,000 of my closest friends. It goes out every Friday. I write every word. There's no ads and it's completely free. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. Did you know that you can watch this same video, but without any ads and get reliable notifications without being algorithmically pressured? And that's because we released this exact same video over on Patreon. But as a thank you, we put in a special bonus story. And this week, it's about how scientists could properly study UAPs and get the same kind of scientific data as expected from particle physicists and, and other sciences. And also a longer outro rant for me about what it's like to be a journalist in these crazy times. So I'll put a link in the show notes so you can watch it over there. Now I'm going to give you some general thoughts about what's happening with NASA right now. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. A special thanks to Abe Kingston, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Michael Purcell, Paul Robach, Sean Sargent, Spiderswap.io, Stephen Fowler Mully, Thomas L. Scadron, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. I don't know if you noticed, but we covered a lot of just astronomy news in this week's episode of Space Bites, even though there is a lot of things going on in the US government this week that relate to NASA, as well as the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, uh, and a lot of other agencies. And we're hearing about Musk getting into spats with the space station commander, we've got announcements that maybe the International Space Station is going to be deorbited in just two years instead of six years, like it's a mess right now. And nothing is kind of locked down. And we have like real news that we can report apart from people are having arguments and things are kind of a mess and people are chaotic and they're scared. But I don't really have anything that I can just say, okay, this is what happened. And so I'm kind of holding off until I've got some really firm events, things that I can report on. And then as soon as these things start to unfold, which they're going to be unfolding very soon, I will try to help you make sense of what's actually going on. So uh, we're light on that news right now, but I promise and I like I'm sorry, but over the coming weeks, you're going to hear a lot more about this as we start to do our reporting on what's actually happening and what the ramifications are of all of the science cuts that are being made. All right, we'll see you next week.